Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Michael Crandell, CEO of RightScale, welcoming you to our session on quick scaling in the cloud for Cloud Slam 2011. Uh, happy to be with you all today. I'm going to be talking about uh, probably one of the most salient aspects of cloud computing and, and the most heralded, which is the elastic scaling capability, the ability to handle bursty traffic, uh, workloads that come and go, and in particular, public-facing websites that uh, that take huge loads uh, on flash crowds and other unpredictable events. What I'm going to do today is cover both some customer stories and give some examples and uh, sort of stories from the trenches of examples of companies that have undergone scaling successfully uh, from different businesses and different applications and then also dive somewhat into the technical side of scaling from, uh, from a cloud stack, if you will, technology point of view, and how automation works, uh, at least in the right scale case, to support scaling. And then we'll allow some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so go ahead and type in questions as, as the talk goes along, if you have them, and we'll, we'll gather those up and, and address them in the end. Word about right scale to start with. Uh, RightScale is the, the leading cloud management system in the world. We've been operating for about four years. We operate worldwide across many different cloud data centers, both public and private. We've launched well more than 2 million servers in the cloud, have more than 40,000 users of our system, and have powered some of the largest production deployments that have occurred to date in cloud computing. I often say that our, our customer list ranges from A to Z uh, as an example, Associated Press to Zynga. These are just a collection of customers. And I think the story that it tells is the wide variety of uh, customers from startups, SMBs, to enterprises that are using cloud today across a wide variety of fields. The classic problem that quick scaling is designed to solve is the one shown in this diagram. And in this diagram, many of you may have seen this, it's a basic cloud concept, but for those who are new, uh, what this diagram depicts is uh, on the yellow dotted line a prediction within an IT department of what hardware resources will be needed uh, for a particular service or application. And so that prediction is made by you know, doing the best you can, often it's inexact. And then the blue line represents actually building out infrastructure, which has to be done in tranches. Normally we're not adding one server at a time, we're adding racks of servers or quantities of servers that are purchased together and added. So you see that stair-stepped blue line represents adding servers. The red line represents a prototypical actual uh, demand on the system. And so the problem with typical traditional hardware model build out is that you've either over provisioned, represented by that green line about a third of the way into the diagram, um, and you're spending money that you didn't need to, or worse yet, you under provision as in that shaded pink area, and the system that you have deployed is either slow or crashes, and you're not delivering to your customers. Again, whether those are internal or external customers. So this, again, is the classic problem solved by so-called automatic scaling, the subject of this talk, quick scaling. And the way it's solved is by having the system monitored and triggers, uh, different automated triggers that are set off. Um, I'll go into the details later, but you can watch various metrics on the systems that are being monitored, both hardware or software metrics, things like CPU load, network traffic, et cetera. And then those green dots represent areas where increasing load is detected. And so uh, automatic scaling at a much more granular level occurs. And you can see that the, the, blue, uh, the blue provisioning much more tightly hugs the curve uh, of the red increasing line. In this graph, it, it's all scaling up, but the same applies to scaling down. And I'll talk more about that. So another word about where RightGale fits into the cloud world. We're this middle layer. Uh, we're a management platform, again, that lives on top of and, and operates infrastructure clouds. 
so-called infrastructure as a service providers. These examples are Amazon EC2, which is probably the biggest, most famous uh, example, other public providers of infrastructure as a service, Rackspace and others. Um, and then private clouds have come onto the scene, those operated by Eucalyptus, cloud.com, um, and other companies. So those are the, the cloud infrastructures or resource pools that you want to manage. And essentially, customers come to us because they're looking to get an ease of use in deploying applications. So you see that RightScale fits at that middle level in between the cloud infrastructure providers and companies who are deploying applications, whether they be public facing services or internal apps. Um, and I won't read through every piece of, of benefit <clears throat> in this chart, but rather just talk about three high level benefits that cloud management provides. The first one is agility, and that spans everything from automation in quick allocation of resources. Again, that's the topic today, quick scaling. But also uh, agility in terms of deploying solutions and having pre-built software stacks that can be accessed very quickly. Uh, second is choice, big benefit around choice, freedom of choice for companies to choose everything from which cloud resource pool they use for a given app to a choice of pre-built cloud-ready components in our library to a choice of partners that they'd like to work with who operate upon or provide solutions upon the RightScale platform. Uh, and finally, control. And that's an important distinguishing characteristic of infrastructure as a service and the way RightScale provides its platform on top of that is you really get full visibility into all aspects of the operation. Everything from the software stack that's being run on any given server, the operating system, the scripts that are run, full access to the source of all that so that you can uh, customize and modify if you need to, through to full control of user access and permissions, who is allowed to see and or um, affect and take control of resources within the cloud. So who can launch servers, who can terminate them, who can see them, etc. Uh, and then finally through to control of cost. So being able to set cost quotas, tracking costs by clusters of servers as well as individual servers, and getting uh, chargeback allocations that you can use internally. So those are our high level benefits. Um, and ultimately, what we're seeking to deliver is managing at scale, whether that scale involves um, quick scaling of resources into thousands of servers or tens of thousands of servers in some cases, or whether it involves scale in terms of how many people are managing those resources. Quite often, uh, there, are, there are entire teams allocated to run different IT projects and other teams that are accessing the applications delivered there. And so there are intersecting and, uh, and crossing uh, matrices of who's allowed to do what and see what and get what. And as a result, this entire system is designed to help you manage at scale, again, whether it's a lot of cloud resources or a lot of people accessing those or both. Uh, so now I'd like to talk a bit about some examples, some case studies and stories of cloud uh, usage by customers, actual customers, and <clears throat> why they've gone to the cloud. In many cases, it does involve the el elasticity implied by scaling. Um, first of all, these white dots represent paying customers from RightScale. This graph is a little bit out of date by now, but it shows how quickly cloud spread globally. Um, and again, the customers who are running infrastructure as a service through RightScale range from web-facing uh, gaming companies, web-facing media companies, bricks and mortar, toy companies, uh, media companies, education, um, gaming companies, etc. So there's a wide range of different applications here uh, across the board, and I'm going to call out some specifically. First example I'd like to talk about is uh, many of you maybe recognize this guy. He's a Bob Dylan, of course, a young Bob Dylan, and he's one of the artists who belongs to Sony Music, whose uh, agency is Sony Music. Sony Music uses the cloud and right scale 
to run its uh, Sony Artist fan sites. And these sites comprise both fan information and sharing of information as well as e-commerce. In other words, products are sold on the sites, everything from music, uh, online music and digital music and CDs, but also promotional items, uh, T-shirts, LP records, amplifiers, etc. And the reason that they use the cloud is, again, for quick scaling. Many, uh, many times artists can be, many artist sites can be consolidated onto a, a small number of servers because at a given time the traffic is not too overwhelming for those sites. But it's very unpredictable for Sony when and where a given artist gets attention. It can happen from a variety of events in life, some of them positive. Maybe there's a, a music tour that gets very popular very fast or a hit song. Um, in other cases, it might be something less fortunate like uh, a brush with the law or, uh, or even an untimely uh, disaster in someone's life, uh, such as when Michael Jackson passed away suddenly. Uh, so whether it's positive or sad, <clears throat> events occur which create a lot of traffic. And so Sony uses the cloud for quick scaling uh, and automatic scaling to handle flash crowds around events in artist life. Second example is around a, a different type of media company. May, maybe many of you know this, Sling.com, and their product is the Sling Box. It's designed to let you view TV content that you subscribe to at home anywhere that you have a, a viewing device. So you can see on the right-hand side, people now view content on everything from the mobile phone, their browser, big screen TV, game console, all these different devices. They all require different resolutions, sometimes different encodings of the media. And so their task is to take content from all of these uh, publishers, CBS, NBC, Fox, etc., and convert it into a multiplicity of formats. And for this, they use a different type of scalable solution, namely batch processing grid. So it's a scalable grid of slave servers that do the same thing. Each server does the same thing. It transcodes from format A into format B, uh, or encodes from format A into format B. And uh, as whenever the content comes in from the publisher, they can run uh, this grid. So if they get a lot of content all at once, they simply run more servers to handle it. And it gives them very quick turnaround without having to uh, purchase the hardware that would be required for peak loads. And that's a key economic point. Another example is mobile applications. Uh, this happens to be our customer HTC, the high-end electronics manufacturer out of Taiwan, and uh, who's gotten into the mobile phone application space. And because mobile devices, smartphones, etc., have a limited amount of processing power on the device, it means that Pretty much in every single case, there has to be a cloud backend that's supporting whatever app is on the mobile phone. Uh, and so they use the cloud to power uh, a variety of different kinds of applications run from their mobile platform. And again, mobile devices, very big category for the cloud. Here's an area that's become a sweet spot for us. It's social gaming, social applications. Uh, namely Facebook apps. Um, so RightScale, the uh, companies on the right circled in red, this was as of a couple months ago in February, uh, really has almost all the leading game companies uh, in, measured in, in terms of um, uh, daily active users and things like that. And on the left are the actual applications. You see the massive scale that uh, these games go to 100 million daily active users on Cityville, and then many, many tens of millions going down the list. These are all powered by RightScale uh, to, to literally very huge infrastructure sizes, uh, tens and tens and tens and thousands of servers powering these games. So while they may be games, all of this is quite serious in terms of the revenue generated, the commerce, and therefore the operational uptime required to power all this. So this has really taken us and the cloud 
to a level of operational excellence that uh, that is absolutely on par with any of the big web, web scale properties. And it means that uh, right scale in the cloud is totally battle tested and ready for your enterprise application, at least in terms of traffic and scaling to this degree. Here's a very different example. It's from the company Mattel. And the example is around their American Girl doll series. If any of you happen to have daughters and also live in America, um, you might be familiar with this doll series. It's a traditional bricks and mortar toy uh, product, but what they did was build a social world, online world called Interstar University to go along with the doll so that uh, anybody really can sign up for free to join that world. But if you want a persistent identity and to get extra privileges, that comes when you buy the doll also. So it's a, it's a two-part offering. And, uh, and they had an event that uh, when they shipped their catalog and introduced this innerstaru.com website, they had a huge flash crowd hit. Um, so they powered all this scaling in the cloud using RightScale. And finally, here's a very different example of uh, applying scalability in a different sense. So there are the poster child stories of scaling up many, many thousands of servers at once. Uh, one story I didn't include in here, it's an old story for us, uh, it's almost three years old now, was Animoto. Um, that the Facebook plugin for their website and went from 50 servers to 3,500 in three days. So there are those poster child stories, but what Eli Lilly did was leverage the scalability of the cloud in a different way. They saw that scaling at a very small scale, uh, namely the agility of launching even one or a small cluster of servers for business users, but very quickly, was, uh, was a compelling concept for them. As a result, they invented something that they called the vending machine, the IT vending machine, offering self-service infrastructure. And uh, these phrases were coined by Dave Powers, who's now moved on from Lilly, but at the time uh, was working in the R&D IT department. And this is a, a sample screen of what their IT vending machine looked like. What it means is their IT department was able to deliver to business users a simple menu of applications, server-based applications. These, again, are just placeholders. You can see they're mostly open source apps. So they were replaced with, uh, for the most part, real apps that Lilly wanted to run. Uh, but these were um, an example of providing to the business user the agility and the small scale scaling of running a server or a couple of, a small cluster of servers at the push of a button. And Dave Powers was brilliant about marketing this concept internally. The average time uh, in their company to deploy a new IT resource like a server was actually five weeks. So he multiplied that out to minutes, and it's about 36,000 minutes. And so he said, this is changing how we think about IT because our deployment time has reduced from 36,000 minutes to 30 minutes. So very different kind of scaling, but much more day-to-day, -day, every day, uh, in terms of its applicability, but super useful if what you're after is providing agility to your business teams in a business where time to market is critical, which, of, of course, drives the entire biopharma industry. It's time to market. So now I'd like to switch over for a moment and talk a little bit about reference uh, architectures on the technical side of quick scaling. What we have here is an overall diagram of a web facing, uh, sorry, a public facing website uh, with the different elements. And I'm going to step through them. Um, it shows the, the, uh, the DNS system, which ties it, your URL to, to your actual web site. And that's pointing traffic into two load balancers, which then distribute it across an array of application servers. And you can see in the yellow area, the dot, dot, dot is intended to represent a scalable array. So that's one part of this, the scalability solution that I'll focus on. Uh, and then that scalable array of app servers talks both directly to a database as well as to caching servers that, that uh, allow increased performance when you scale the database. 
which is then talking to different uh, slave databases for redundancy, which then back up, let's say, to the S3 uh, very, very resilient um, storage system. So here's, here's just a reference architecture, and I'm going to step through it. This is really the core of uh, a basic scalable web application. So first, let's look at that load balancing tier. So DNS uh, points traffic in a round robin basis to two load balancer servers, so they're redundant load balancers, and it means that if one of those servers crashes, uh, traffic can be directed to the other one and will automatically be redirected to the other one uh, until you can bring up another load balancer to uh, begin to share the traffic again. So that's a resilient uh, kind of architecture for to handle failover in the case of a failure. The next tier is the application server tier. Uh, I put here that it puts the scalable in any scalable application. Normally it's the app server uh, that takes most of the heat in, uh, of scalability. Um, and so true auto-scaling is a must in any dynamic, unpredictable situation. And I'll talk a little bit about how those app servers scale. Basically what happens is that these triggers that I talked about earlier are, are set off by different metrics being reached in the system based on thresholds that, uh, that the user or the designer of the system can set up. So to give you an example, you can set triggers, for example, on CPU idle or CPU busy time, on how much or how little free memory there is, or system load. Or you could set up custom triggers based on how many connections your uh, web server, how many HTTP connections are being maintained, or other application-specific metrics. A typical example is, let's say, when the CPU gets 50% busy for more than three minutes, then have that server uh, vote to RightScale that it wants to trigger a scaling event. RightScale then watches all of the application servers so that a single rogue server that gets busy doesn't continuously cause scaling, but it watches across the whole array. And another level of rules is set up to say when X percent of those application servers are voting to scale up, then let's issue a scale up process. So that's basically how the scaling works. RightScale is, is kind of looking over the shoulder of the application array. And as these triggers are hit, they vote with the RightScale system. And then there's a voting threshold rule set within RightScale. So some of the basic rules, when should you scale? Well, we recommend being conservative about that. In other words, if you're scaling up, scale up early. <laughs> don't wait till the last minute. So set the rule. Don't set it at 95% CPU busy. Maybe set it at 50 or 60%. And the same with scaling down. Don't scale down too quickly. Um, the cloud is wonderful in the sense that you, you only pay for what you use, but allowing a server or two or, or a few to run a bit longer is no big deal. So on scaling up, you need to allow adequate time for the new servers to become operational. It does take time for a server to boot up and load to be allocated and then, uh, and then boot up and load. And you want that to happen before the traffic reaches an overload situation. And the worst that happens is you're charged for an extra hour. Uh, and so that's not that big a deal. On the scaling down, it's the same, same kind of uh, system, only in the opposite direction. So we watch for idle time on the CPU, let's say. And when the CPU drops below 20% utilized, 30% utilized for more than a certain number of minutes, to vote to scale down. Uh, and I'll talk later about how the server coming up and coming down is actually controlled in a very, uh, a very elegant way. Uh, but again, if you leave it running a little bit longer because you have a conservative rule, that's fine. Next part of the scalable system is, a, is uh, simply using caching to have a, a, a scalable number of cache servers uh, that are caching read-intensive apps that are hitting the database a lot. So that's one layer that can be set up and uh, is pretty easy to set up for applications, again, that 
have a lot of traffic that does reads. That's that element in the system. Then for the database tier itself, there really are a number of ways to set this up. There are a number of different architectural options. Then there's no single solution. In this diagram, what you're looking at here is a master uh, database. Let's say it's MySQL connected to uh, on Amazon to an Elastic Block Store volume, so a separate volume, and then doing replication to two different slaves uh, in different availability zones. So that's for the purpose of fail failover and resiliency. And each of those slaves also using EBS volumes. And then the slave volumes are doing periodic snapshots to S3 as shown in the previous diagram. When you need to scale the database, there are really two different approaches. Uh, database scaling is one of the toughest parts of the whole picture, always has been. Uh, but within reason, there are two different approaches. One is so-called horizontal scaling. Particularly, uh, I'll talk about two modes of doing horizontal scaling, meaning you add more servers or more instances in cloud parlance. The other type of scaling is to move up to a larger server or a larger instance. Uh, so both are valid approaches. Uh, the horizontal scaling usually requires a little more architectural work, whereas the vertical scaling is uh, is just really redeploying the server software onto a bigger instance, and that's both are situations that RightScale has pre-configured solutions for. So here's an example of of the one first type of horizontal scaling, where the type of scaling that you need involves uh, reads, um, more reads than there are writes. So here you would set up multiple slaves to handle the read traffic. That's one model to do that, and a, an effective approach to that is using MySQL proxy, for example. Uh, so that's example number one. Example number two for horizontal database scaling is what's called sharding. Sharding is separating uh, your full database into many databases, each of which contain a portion of your entire data. So in this example, just for ease of use, we consider the, the key field in the database to be separated out alphabetically. So let's say this was a database of people where the last names A through E were put in one database and F through M in the next, et cetera, et cetera. That's called sharding. That also requires um, some re-architecting of the system. Um, so what's the best approach overall? to scaling if you look at the entire system? Well, to be honest, it's uh, as in many technology discussions, it depends. It depends exactly on what you're looking for and what your needs are, um, how the application behaves, what the traffic to the database looks like in terms of reads and writes, et cetera, et cetera. So it depends. But to address that situation, what we've done is assembled quite a nice collection of pre-built components. And I'll talk more about what we mean by pre-built in a moment. But we have components for different OSs that use different language frameworks, a variety of data store approaches from relational database to other approaches, NoSQL approaches, several different web servers, different load balancing solutions, and different automation solutions. So. Rather than a one-size-fits-all, what we've done is assemble this library of solutions, which, by the way, you can add to yourself and uh, kind of write your own in the RightScale world uh, if there's a piece here that's not already ready to use. But we have tried to hit the sweet spot of very commonly used componentry based on customer requests. And so we have, we have quite a, a full library, which, by the way, you can browse uh, there's a free edition of RightScale at rightscale.com. You can sign up for free and uh, take a look at our library. These servers, the pre-built solutions, the app servers, database servers, web servers, load balancer, every server in that previous diagram is based on a concept that we call the server template. And a server template is an architectural innovation, we believe, on top of machine images. So whereas machine images attempt to freeze everything about a server from the operating system to the applications to the configuration settings 
into one disk image that then loads, server templates are very different from that. They still use machine images, but we typically take a very plain vanilla basic machine image with just the OS and maybe a handful of very, very commonly used utilities that are used on almost every server. And then the software that loads at boot time that can be activated during runtime and the decommissioning uh, software is all loaded dynamically from the right scale system with variables passed in. So what this allows you to do is dynamic runtime configuration of servers as opposed to using machine images where everything is frozen into uh, a single a single disk image and then loaded all at once. Um, this is a very flexible system. Sometimes we call it object-oriented programming for sysadmins because it applies the same flexibility that programmers get from integrated development environments where they can choose from a wide variety of features in, in libraries and bring them in as, as they need them. It does the same thing for, uh, for machine configurations. Um, we also make these server templates portable across different clouds. And they provide, as the name and the word template implies, very predictable, reusable componentry to which you can pass into a few variables. So uh, an example is an application server that, say, runs Tomcat, where uh, all you do is pass in the variable of the host name of the database that it's supposed to talk to, and perhaps the, uh, the URL or the name of the load balancers that, uh, that that app server is supposed to connect with. And so use the same template for all your app servers and just change the variables in different deployments if, if and when needed. So it's a very flexible architecture. It's kind of like server DNA at the end of the day. It means you can define, for example, in this example, you can create a definition or a template of a web server and deploy it on various public clouds, deploy it on private clouds, deploy it in some future cloud without retuning and recustomizing that template every time. Very, very powerful, powerful concept that underlies uh, everything that I've shown you so far, and in particular, the automated scaling capability. So ultimately, what we're going to deliver here, what we seek to deliver, is unified management. We've got a little screenshot of RightScale on the right-hand side here. What it shows is three different clouds. Two of them are public clouds, Amazon Web Services and Rackspace, and another is a Eucalyptus Systems private cloud, happens to be running at UC Santa Barbara in this example, all from a single pane of glass, hybrid clouds uh, and different resource pools all exposed alongside each other, easily accessible from a single interface. And again, it drives freedom of choice back into your hands so that you, you get to choose which resource pool you want to use where, so you avoid lock into a single vendor. You can utilize existing data center resources once they're cloudified, uh, in my language, by Eucalyptus, Cloud.com, other solutions like that. You may have to choose different resource pools for purposes of geolocation. Uh, perhaps you need one in Asia that in Southeast Asia for latency and bandwidth and performance reasons, right? Or you may need to locate somewhere specific, either internally or externally, for legal compliance reasons. Uh, maybe it's European privacy laws. Maybe it's your own internal corporate policies. So again, all of this drives the choice back to the user, freedom of choice in the hands of the user of which resource pool they use when and for what reason. So that kind of wraps up the, uh, the basic session about quick scaling in the cloud. I realize it's an overview. Um, would like to invite you all to a couple of, a couple of uh, different uh, sources of information as well as events. First of all, we have a biannual user conference that's, that's very partner, customer, and user oriented. The next one's happening June 8th in New York City. It'll be our fourth user conference. And uh, the last one, we had hundreds of attendees. Again, most of the focus is on uh, customer stories. 
as well as breakout sessions that range from overviews of how to promote cloud in your company to very technical sessions, uh, everything from boot camps on zero to cloud in two hours to sessions on security, uh, scalability, uh, app deployment, and a number of other topics from ourselves and from partners. So we'd like to invite you to that. would also invite you to check out our website where we have a very large library of webinars covering a variety of topics, uh, including scalable web app applications that goes into more depth on the technicalities of how to create scalable web apps um, in the cloud, as well as a, a wide variety of other topics. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and we'll wrap up the presentation portion right now and move into Q&A. Uh, I see a, one question here. Uh, from someone, it says, VMs that are managed by your solution, can the CPU and RAM be adjusted on the fly within any particular VM? So the answer is that that's uh, a level of um, control that is normally provided by the lower level infrastructure as a service uh, solution. So I know from some cloud providers that's possible. So for example, uh, Terramark, I believe, allows you to dial in the RAM and uh, CPU power for a particular VM and change it on the fly. Um, other clouds don't. So for example, on Amazon EC2, when you launch a virtual server, which again they call an instance, um, you cannot change the characteristics in terms of RAM and CPU power once that instance has been deployed. Uh, you, you just live with it. So the approach there is not so much to tune the, the CPU and memory in the running instance as it is to launch additional instances or transition over to a bigger instance and relaunch, um, which is the other approach. Let's see if we have any other questions coming in today. Go ahead and type into the chat box if you do have other questions. Here's one. How, on average, how, how great are the savings in cost through auto scaling? Well, for that question, you know, it varies a lot depending on your workloads. Some applications are more steady state. Some of them uh, are quite wildly varying in terms of loads. I, uh, I would point you, first of all, on the website, there's a TCO calculator from our home page, I think you can find uh, the TCO calculator, and that helps determine for different types of applications what the cloud cost would be versus internal cost. And so it exactly reports to you what the cost savings uh, would be projected to be. Typically, in traditional data center uh, approaches, whether it's hosted or internal, in my experience, companies try to allocate twice what they think the maximum load will be. In other words, they, they estimate the maximum load that they're ever going to see or that they're going to see this year, and then they double that just as a safety. So it's, it's pretty drastically over-provisioning uh, for most of the time. Let's see. Next question, what's the time resolution for auto scaling, uh, time resolution meaning how fast can we auto scale? So the answer to that is that RightScale detects the situation extremely quickly. Uh, some of the rules are designed not to fire off on a hair trigger because uh, you do get spurious situations that might be momentary CPU loads of 80%, but it lasts for you know 15 seconds and then it goes back down. Not doesn't really require an auto scale. So most of our rules, one common rule is watch for the CPU to be busy more than uh, three minutes, more than 50% CPU busy for more than three minutes, and then vote to scale up. At that point, you've got some time still to react because you're only 50% busy. But it's been happening for a while, so the constant load is there for at least three minutes. And then it depends on the boot time of 
additional resources, let's say it's an application server, on average that ranges uh, you know, from three minutes to seven, eight, ten minutes, averaging around five. Uh, sometimes shorter, depends on what software is being loaded. So auto scaling really would probably happen within a 10 minute window. That's the reactionary auto scaling. We also have an auto scaling feature that is called scheduled scaling. So if you have a business where you know that every day at midnight or 8 a.m. or some specific time crowds hit, uh, then you can tell the system to automatically scale at a particular time of day. So for example, one application that uses stock quotes does exactly that because people always check stock quotes in the morning, tapers off at lunch, they check again in the afternoon near the close of the market, and then it goes away in the evening. So it's a very predictable tra uh, traffic pattern. Next question is how does RightScale compete with similar products? So, uh, you know, there are two categories of products. There are a collection of kind of control panels out there in the world, and sometimes we're compared with those. Uh, the actual dashboard of RightScale is, is really a relatively small part of the system. Much more of the benefit and value that you get has to do with things like the server template architecture, the automation behind the dashboard, the library of solutions that we provide, and the advanced management capabilities that span sort of life cycle of development, including things like user permissions, cost tracking, audit records, things like that. So I would say that compared to the control panel type solutions out there, RightScale is quite a bit more mature and advanced. We were the initial solution out there. We were the inventor of auto scaling on Amazon uh, initially. And what we mostly compete with, though, uh, to talk about, for example, our sales team of prospective customers coming in, they're mostly comparing using RightScale to using more traditional approaches to IT, like managed hosting, or to some do-it-yourself solution. What if we try to use the cloud on our own versus using you? And there the typical trade-off applies of uh, if you if you really want to spend your time reinventing a system for automating cloud infrastructure, uh, or do you want to pay right scale for that who's already done it and done it longer and perhaps done it better and focus your attention on what really differentiates your business and your core competency that sets you apart and gives you a business advantage. That's the kind of trade-off that's done there. So with that, I think we're wrapping up on questions. Uh, if there are any others, please type them in now. Otherwise, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the session. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cloud Slam uh, folks for inviting RightScale to present and thank all of you for attending. Again, you're welcome to visit us at, at rightscale.com. Please sign up uh, to visit us if you're in the New York area at our user conference. And please take advantage of, of a wide range of information and educational resources we have on the site, as well as the free edition of RightScale that's permanently free, uh, that's easy to sign up for and, and attach to a cloud account. So thanks very much. Look forward to, uh, to your feedback, and have a great day.